Hey everybody, welcome back. This is the arrays lesson in the objects unit in module zero. Uh, so welcome. This is the video walkthrough of this lesson and it's gonna go right here. Uh, so, what is an array? Um, so far we discussed several data types uh, and you're aware of the ones we went over and we've been writing functions at the same times that are slowly building in complexity and we're gonna kinda keep that going. Consider these data types to be something called scalar. Uh, the next two data types that we're going to do, arrays and objects, are both examples of collections of data. And this is one of those sections I'm going to read out just because it's, um, well, there's more information here than what we're going to tell you. But the information that we're going to tell you is going to be enough such that you can keep moving. And keep in mind that we're going to revisit a lot of these topics and you're going to hear these over and over again. So here's your first introduction to some of the weird stuff. Uh, the array object. Now it's like, why do we say the object? Um, okay, so first, arrays are zero indexed, like strings. So we start at index zero when we're talking about an array. And then they're also considered objects in JavaScript. Now I wrote that for several reasons, none of which truly matter to us at this point. And what I mean by that is that it's not really gonna change your ability to manipulate arrays or use them in a, in a you know, a programming situation to, to know why they're considered objects. It's just going to be useful if you keep in mind that for whatever reason, they're considered objects. So anyway, let's go ahead and start looking at some code at Replit. So I'm gonna go over to Replit. Now, a previous version of this course had me doing a lot of this in the console, which again is command option J, and that's this one over here. Uh, no, thank you. And we can run code here for sure. There was also a lesson that described how to kind of save snippets in your Chrome console and run them here. Um, and that's all well and good. You are absolutely more than free to do that. I really like uh, Replit, a lot of reasons. One, the people who are involved with Replit were very, very kind to us at a point um, when we were trying to host some data on their website, basically a bunch of problems and they gave it to us for free, longer than they probably had to. And just look at all these different languages you can do. Lots of different things to do from this website and I never think that it's a bad idea to introduce really useful tools out there, um, just because. So we're gonna click on JavaScript. This isn't something that you would need to do if you had signed in and saved them all the time. But just to show you how to do it, I'm gonna change the theme to dark and disabling code intelligence. So let's come back over here. Oh, by the way, real quick, if you're on the Mac OS operating system and you keep seeing me click back and forth between tabs, what I'm doing is I'm hitting control and then tab. If I hit control and then tab, that's going to allow me to switch between the tabs of whatever uh, browser I'm using, actually, uh, the Chrome browser I'm using. I'm not exactly sure if it works with other browsers, but it does work with Chrome. So I wanna make sure that if there's anything that I'm doing uh, that I have not explained. I'll try to explain at some point during these videos. So there you go. I'm going to copy all of this, bring it on over to Replit. Okay, so we have two arrays. Variable fruits is equal to, and an array is done by these square brackets. So we wrap a square bracket around and we separate each of the elements using a comma. Now fruits is a bunch of strings, oranges, bananas, and apples. And then scores is an array of numbers. So we have 98, 85, 91, 78, uh, 82. Pretty decent scores. I guess the 78 isn't that great, but let's consider this an engineering course, which means that these are incredibly good scores. So we have created two arrays. This is how you do it. Uh, on line four and five, we're accessing individual elements of those arrays. So we're going to assign to first fruit, fruits at index zero, and then variable third score is equal to scores at index two. So if they're zero indexed, to get the first one, you go at zero. To get the third one, you would go at two. So theoretically, we should have first fruit equal to oranges, and third score equal to 91. Now I keep saying equal, and one of the things that's going to limit your ability to stretch towards other programming languages is that we don't really mean equal. What we mean when we have the single equals is we mean is assigned to the value of the expression on the other side. So what generally happens is that the right side gets evaluated first. In this case, there's not really an evaluation because we just wrote an array there. But then you could say something like fruits gets or let fruit be equal to for the time being. A lot of those kind of things might help you sort of understand the way other programming languages are set up, at least from a very, very basic level. But we do use equal, but you don't want to consider that this is like an equal, like an equation equal. We'll come across a way to check if two things are actually equivalent later on. For now though, um, okay, so we signed first score, third score, and now we've got our console.log messages. Here's the identifier for each one, and then the actual value. So let's go ahead and run this, and it'll console.log what we want. First fruit oranges, third score 91. So here's the creation of the arrays. 
here's the accessing of elements within the array, and then here is proof that it worked the way we, ought, we think it ought to. Uh, an empty array. Uh, so we did this with strings, same thing with arrays. This is actually building towards a pattern that we'll go over later, and the idea is that sometimes you want a variable of a specific type, but you don't want anything in it at the moment when you're creating it. Now, why that would happen is not important. The fact that it would happen is important. And so we'll just do a quick demonstration here that's not really going to show us much, but it will at least prove the concept does exist. So empty array is equal to, and I'm just wrapping square brackets around nothing. There are other ways to do this, but like everything in this course, we're going to show you one way so that you can understand the concept. And then later on, when other methods of the same concept come up, you'll be able to understand it because you have an underlying understanding of how to, at least one way to do it. So if we console.log our empty array, I'm not exactly sure what it's going to say. Cool. So just an empty array listed out. Good for us. Anyway, now we have two examples and then a third example that's kind of separate. So here's one example where we have a function. Like everything, we're going to take it over to get our understanding nice and solid. First, we declare a function. We declare a function by writing function, the name of the function, parentheses, the parameter inside of the parentheses, opening up a curly brace, and then closing it to define what the def function definition should do. So this one's real simple. Takes in an array parameter and just returns that array parameter. So now that we've worked on the definition, or at least understood it a little bit, we're going to describe a way to use this function in a call to that function. So first we're going to need a variable. And the reason that we need a variable is because using a variable as an argument is, the, is kind of the name of this uh, subheading, if you will. Previously, a lot of times what we would do is when we would call our function, we would just list the actual value that we wanted. All that we're going to do here is picture that we don't always need to do that. We could use a variable like we're doing in this case. So variable fruits is equal to our fruits array. Um, and then we're going to pass that into our call to the function here. So we say result array is going to be equal to, or we're assigning it to the value returned from return array called on fruits. Then we console on log result array, and we're just going to see fruits because return array takes in the fruits array, and then when we look at the definition, whatever the uh, whatever's passed in is just returned rather simply. So we hit run, and we're going to see our fruits array. Now. A lot of people, when they get to this point in the course, are starting to think like, hey, am I actually ever going to do anything with these functions? And yes, you're going to do a ton with these functions. But the idea is repetitive practice of something that is building towards more complex versions of itself. We're not really going to stretch too far in any direction before we get a handle on all of the data that we can use when we're talking about functions. So if you're, if you're bored at this point, hang in there. You might not need to watch these videos anymore until we get to later on in the course. But do know that we are going to ramp up rather significantly, but keeping in mind what we're doing here, a function definition, a call to the function, proof that the function does what we think it should, that's the recipe. And we're gonna do it over and over again until it's almost second nature. So now we come back here and we have another version. This one's slightly more complicated. Rather than just returning the entire array, we're going to return, I believe, an individual element in that array. So we have an array and an index. And you might remember that this is probably rather similar to what we did with a string. So we have scores and then position. And again, instead of just uh, directly calling the function with the real values we want, we're defining variables first and then calling the function on those variables. So if we can pass scores and position as our arguments to return an element, return an element is going to access scores, which is this array right here, at whatever position we call, which is this index right here. So theoretically, when we console.log position element, position element is going to be scores at index 3, which should be, well, let me highlight it, 78. So let's run and see the position element is equal to 78. And it is. So excellent work on that. Let's come back here and now creating a variable inside of a function definition. So every function that we've done so far has done essentially what we're doing here, which is we have some parameters and we basically return either the parameter itself or a combination of the parameters. We can also, if we want to, create new variables inside of our function. And in general, if that comes up, it's generally better to create a variable inside of the function rather than trying to access a variable that is listed outside of the function. What I mean by that exactly is something that we are going to get into later. Again, we're just introducing topics and concepts with the idea that, hey, this is one way that is going to work. Do this way until you understand more about the situation. So declare a function that takes no parameters. Good. 
creates an array. So on line three, this is just the same thing as we've been doing with all of the examples so far, except we're actually putting it inside of the function. Mm, I'm hesitating because there is something that we could go into about this. And mm, no, we will not go into that just now. So just keep in mind that we're creating the variable inside of here rather than using a parameter, and then we're going to return it. Now, this doesn't preclude the idea that there could be parameters for this function, but it's a new concept, so we wanted to leave it by itself. On line 7, after we've written the definition of the function, we're going to make a call to that function, which, again, takes no parameters, so when we call it, it doesn't take any arguments. We're assigning to result array the return value from this function when called. We're going to console.log that and have a look, and when we have a look, we should just see this array that we created inside of here returned directly. And we're in good shape. So now we've got some array coding challenges, which, like all the challenges in this first section, when we're just kind of introducing the, uh, the variables and, and what types they can have, nothing super complicated. So we want a function that takes an array parameter and returns it. Let's scour the documentation. Sorry, I typed an F there by accident. And looks like we just return array. That's going to be our best bet. So if we scroll on down here, return array, we're going to run the tests, and we're in good shape. So, same thing for this one. We read the definition and we realize that there is some part of the documentation that does almost exactly this. So, for this one, let's just have a look at it and we're going to type it out ourselves. So, we could copy and paste, but sometimes you want to get used to actually writing things out because you'll never be able to hit those square brackets in step during an interview unless you start typing them out. So, we have been copying and pasting till now, but it might be a good idea to start writing the code out yourself. After you look at the documentation, Sometimes that's not going to be possible, and you'll need to copy and paste for a while, but eventually you do want to move towards the, uh, a place where you could write out the code yourself. Okay, so we're going to complete a function that takes no parameters. This function should create an array and return it. So here we have a couple of comments that are acting as pseudocode, which we've had before. So the first thing I'm going to do is create an array. So I'll say variable, and the name for this is kind of uh, esoteric, meaning we don't really know what this function does. We don't really know what the array is. So let's just name the first thing that comes into our mind. Now there's a picture next to my desk, so I'm going to say pictures. Pictures is going to be equal to an empty array because I don't really have a name of this picture that's on my desk. Then we're going to return the created array. So return pictures. Now I can spoiler alert this. I wrote the test for this. All it's going to do is check to see that the return value for your function is an array. So we could do this and we could run the test. Oh gosh create an array is not defined. Ah, that is because when I changed the tests, I changed this from create and return an array. Uh, I changed it to create and return an array from create an array. So, uh, well, no, nah, let's leave the video. I think the blemishes are good. So what I'm going to do to fix this for this video is I'm going to change this from create and return to create an array. Because essentially what this error means is that, hey, I was looking for a function called create an array, but you don't have one. And so now that I have a function called create an array, and it does what the function uh, des is described as doing, this should work. Excellent. Now when you do this, I will change the test so that the original name of the function is what shows up, so you won't need to worry about that, but it's never that bad of an idea to watch somebody fix some errors. One last thing. We don't actually need to create an array here. We could just return an array directly by saying return an array like that. Now, what's actually happening is essentially what happens here. We just don't have a name for it. But for our purposes, let's just kind of ignore that for now. Uh, just kidding. Let's not ignore it. Let's show that it actually works that way. So I'm going to comment out the creation of the line. And what I'm implying here is that this actually creates an array in line. So if we're in the test here, we're in good shape there as well. But let's go back to what it was previously, and we'll leave it at this. So thanks for watching. That's pretty much it for the arrays lesson. I am going to adjust this so that it doesn't seem as awkward to you. But again, you're probably going to see more errors in these videos than you would during a more curated video. And the idea is that getting good at debugging can oftentimes be a case of just watching people do it enough. So that's why they're going to be in there. And yeah. Okay, so that's pretty much it. The next lesson, we're going to introduce objects. So thanks for watching this video. I hope you enjoyed it, and we'll see you in the next one.